How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on the show, with the Trump administration cementing its position on major issues, much has been made of the partisan divide when it comes to climate change. But there are Republicans who accept the science and want to work on solutions. We're joined by former South Carolina Congressman Bob Inglis, who paid the ultimate political price because of his views. Jeremy Carl, a research fellow from Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and former president of Shell Oil, John Hoffmeister. But first, can clean tech clean up our future? Three experts with a vested interest in the clean tech game talk about what's real and what's hype in today's green energy landscape. We'll hear from founder of Clean Energy Works, Holmes Hummel, managing director of the California Clean Energy Fund, Danny Kennedy, and managing partner of 1955 Capital, Andrew Chung. Where are we headed? Up next on Climate One. When, when we deregulated the electricity market, um, we started a boom in Texas in the renewable energy sector. Uh, today, the nation's leading developer of wind energy is not one of those progressive states on the East Coast or the West Coast. The number one wind energy producing state in the nation is along the Gulf Coast. It's in Texas. What do you see as the, the ability of the Trump administration to slow down, move toward clean energy? Well, I think one of the things that um, the DOE in the last 11 years that I've been involved with clean tech has done very successfully is foster fundamental science research and innovation. Um, when I was at Lightspeed for five years and then as a, as a partner at Coastal Ventures for another five years, uh, we worked with a lot of companies that uh, spun out of the ARPA-E program. Uh, which was a special research group within the Department of Energy that focused on investing in very, very early stage uh, breakthrough projects at national labs, at universities, uh, within certain companies. And that type of innovation is absolutely critical to our energy future. Um, many of the financial investors like myself or other groups have a more difficult time investing when it's only a professor and uh, an idea for a new breakthrough in physics. And over the last 10, 11 years, because of the support of the DOE and projects like that, uh, as well as other programs to foster the commercialization of these types of technologies, uh, we had a lot of hope that uh, America would be able to maintain that technology leadership. And the, one of the things that I worry about with uh, the current administration is the level of focus and emphasis on a number of those types of projects, which I hope uh, will continue to exist because it is fundamental to American competitiveness, fundamental to our energy future, and it's something that, if we do it the right way, uh, can allow us to maintain that type of leadership going forward. This is a really challenging position for the federal leaders who have civil service careers at the Department of Energy, have been stewarding billions of dollars in public portfolios to invest in the innovation ecosystem of the United States that keeps us competitive globally as Andrew was just pointing out, to keep the United States relevant and leading in a clean energy future where each new breakthrough uh, allows us to remain competitive in the enterprises that create jobs and create economic opportunity for our people. Danny Kennedy, your take on how the Trump administration will handle clean energy and maybe Rick Perry won't, well, maybe he'll support it as he did in Texas. <clears throat> yeah, either that or he'll be run over by it. You know, there's a moving train and they're either going to get on board or get caught in the tracks because it's no longer just about what the federal government does, what California does, what many other states do, and more importantly, what the rest of the world does is going to drive this market so that in 2020, at the end of this first and hopefully last term of this administration, 
we will have solar at half the cost now and more than double the volume globally. We will have storage similarly scaling through this technology cost curve, which has always been relentlessly down for wind solar storage, which means we will be delivering the lowest cost electricity <coughs> of any technology anywhere ever in history, lower than when coal was first invented as a steam boiling tool to uh, drive turbines and, and so on. So they can't stop that. They can try to get in the way. They can harm Americans who will miss out on the benefits of that, which are cleaner air, climate protection, uh, lower cost electricity, as I mentioned, the jobs inherent in it, just to name a few. Or they can get on the bandwagon, as their major peers have in the world. China, for example, just announcing in its next five-year plan, $320 billion worth of spend on this by 2020. The Indians committing to 100 gigawatts by 2022 of solar alone, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's for Trump and friends to decide whether they want to be riding the tide or fighting it, but I know who will lose. Home Summer, let's pick up on the jobs. What are some of the most recent data on jobs in the clean energy sector? You know, where the, are they? Where are they growing? Where are they? The United States Energy Employment Report uh, released in January gave us some very hopeful news about the tide in the United States. Uh, solar jobs up by a quarter, wind jobs up by a third, together accounting for about half a million jobs, more than half of which are in the construction and manufacturing sectors. But even twice as large as that is the jobs that were documented in the energy efficiency industries, also accessible jobs uh, in the trades, and on top of those million jobs in energy efficiency was another near quarter million jobs in efficient vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid vehicles, uh, and hybrid electric vehicles. Can I just jump in to point out the counterpoint, which is that fossil fuels, meanwhile, are shrinking jobs, like 150,000 permanently deleted from the workforce in America in that same period. And you know, coal mining is now maybe 60,000 strong in this country. We're talking about a solar sector alone that employs 300,000 people. Then there's these other ones that, that Holmes just mentioned. The oil and gas production industry is maybe 120, 150,000 people in America. They're not big employers. They just carry this mythical status in our mind while clean energy industries are the job creators in America coming out of the Great Recession year on year, growing jobs 20% compounded per annum. And Andrew Chung, why is there this perception that clean energy means pain and killing jobs, saving the environment? Is that a false dichotomy? Um, if you look at China, in 2013, one single year they deployed more solar in one year than the United States did in an, its entire history. Because of the level of government support around the initiative, the desperation in that country for cleaner air and renewable sources of energy, and an entrepreneurial movement around creating companies and creating jobs to be able to foster this type of new deployment there. Similar stories in places like India, Southeast Asia, and other places where, again, perhaps unlike what we have here where generally, uh, except for today, nice weather, blue skies, white clouds, in places like that you have millions of people dying every year of air pollution related disorders. So that has created this type of movement that has enabled a breathtaking growth in sectors like solar, wind, et cetera, which has created a massive number of jobs in a lot of these countries and also creating new economies as a result. And so Danny mentioned the five-year plan in China. The Chinese executives have essentially put clean energy as one of its top three initiatives for the next five years and arguably beyond. And part of that is what's good for the country in terms of the, uh, the uh, shift to better and cleaner resources, but the other part is what it can do to the middle class that's growing there in job creation and enabling a new type of economy to, to result. Danny Kennedy, what are some dazzling things out there that we have, uh, haven't seen yet that some gee whiz technologies that might really be game changers that might really catch our attention <clears throat> we haven't heard about yet? Just one comes to mind as you ask that question is maybe not too gee whiz, but something I think is game changing, which are electric bikes. If you think about electric assist bicycles and how often you're starting to see them in the streets of this city <coughs> and cities all around the world, they're the most sold bicycle in Amsterdam these days. This ability to put lithium ion and the energy density in that battery stack into a bicycle 
and to transform two-wheel mobility into something that can move a lot of people that aren't just bicyclists, you know, f uh, people that use their bikes a lot and use them for all sorts of different functions, moving goods around and so forth, is, is going to change the way we plan cities, is going to change the, the walkable, livable scale and nature of our communities. And that stuff's being pioneered by, you know, at the moment in America, I think there's a great story, a company called Gen Z, which stands for Generation Zero Emissions. And the entrepreneur behind it is a uh, South Asian gentleman, Vish Paleka, is an Indian migrant to the US, now an American citizen. And he's working for Mahindra, the giant conglomerate out of India that produces more tractors than John Deere. But he's producing electric assist bicycles in Fremont, California, and electric mm -hmm. assist scooters in Detroit, Michigan. And the scooters here in San Francisco are the scoot system that you see on the streets. The fact that you've got like an Indian entrepreneur changing the game with electric mobility services, I think is, is one of those great examples of how weird and wacky and wonderful this world is and what is going to come of it. You know, when I left the Department of Energy, one of the things that distressed me the most was the growing clean energy divide that was produced by the financing mechanisms that all of our entrepreneurs were left with to ask people if they were wealthy enough to take out the loan, sign the lease, or take on the lien, or if they were poor enough to qualify for the assistance. And if you couldn't prove to your contractor that you were one or the other, you just weren't in the clean energy revolution. I don't think the clean energy revolution is a spectator sport, and I don't think it's possible to get to 100% clean energy without 100% of the people. So I became more committed to inclusive financing, and I think it's the biggest breakthrough of our time. To imagine being able to open all cost-effective clean energy resources to all people everywhere, regardless of their income, their credit score, or their renter status. And the good news is that the people mm. who already know how to do this are in some unlikely and improbable places, like the coal fields of Eastern Kentucky or the persistent poverty zone that for 150 years has been in Northeast North Carolina. Even more recently, Calhoun County in Southern Arkansas that showed within six months they could get a unanimous vote out of their utility commission to approve inclusive financing to allow their utility to invest in anything that was cost effective on the customer side of the meter and upgrade their homes, buildings, school buildings, colleges, anything that was cost effective, including a net savings component for the customer and allow the utility to recover their costs on the bill with a charge that was less than the savings. We allowed uh, the Clean Energy Works, um, were allowed the opportunity to work with communities <coughs> in each of these frontline community areas, the coal fields in Eastern Kentucky, down East North Carolina, Southern Arkansas. And we've seen investment profiles surge once inclusive financing is introduced. It's my commitment to be able to open up more of those markets to more products and solutions in a technology neutral way so that no matter what gee whiz comes along, it's open to everybody. <laughs>Um, then I was out six years doing commercial real estate law again in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, ran for Congress after Jim DeMint left the seat to go to the Senate. Uh, my son came to me in 04 and said, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. <laughs> um, and so um, uh, the, the second step in the metamorphosis is going to Antarctica and seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. Third step was really something of a spiritual awakening 
another science committee trip, Great Barrier Reef, Aussie climate scientist showing us coral bleaching. I could tell we shared the world view. You know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. Scott was preaching the gospel. I could see it in his eyes, hear it in his voice. Um, and later he told me about conservation changes. He's making his life in order to love God and love people. And I got right inspired, uh, wanted to be like Scott, loving God, loving people, and came home and introduced the Raise Wages, Cut Carbon Act of 2009. Probably not a good idea to introduce a carbon tax in the midst of the Great Recession in the reddest district and the reddest state in the nation. But uh, <laughs> So that was three-step metamorphosis. So Bob, finish that. So you were then lost a Tea Party primary, is that right? Lost to a Tea Party Oh yeah, candidate. there is that. Um, yeah, that... Uh, <laughs> I was trying to avoid the unpleasantness of late. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in 2010, uh, there's this guy named Trey Gowdy who got 71% of the vote in a Republican primary, and I got the other 29% uh, in a Republican runoff after 12 years in Congress, which is a rather spectacular face plant. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, if Rick Perry can come back from one, two, I think maybe I could come back after. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, it, it's rather spectacular face plant, though, in that, in that fourth district of South Carolina. John Hoffmeister, uh, I believe it was the late 1990s, uh, scientists had just concluded that there was a human fingerprint, that human activity was warming uh, the atmosphere. Saudi Arabia, Venezuela had signed on to this uh, international climate science report, and the industry responded by forming the Global Climate Coalition, uh, took a page from the tobacco playbook. Uh, oil companies were part of this to, to push back. You were... Uh, at Shell Oil at that time, what did you do about that group? I, I was actually at the parent headquarters in The Hague, and I had a global position, and we saw that Shell Oil had joined this group, Global Climate Coalition, and uh, we researched it to find a little bit about what it was doing, always worried about what our subsidiary in the U.S. was up to, <laughs> because sometimes the U.S. subsidiary was not exactly aligned with the global headquarters. And so as we dug into it, we found indeed that this looked like a fishy organization that seemed to promote one thing, but actually did another. And that is they seemed to be interested superficially in effects on climate, but in fact they were working to defeat any legislative effort to do anything that might amend how business is practiced and how industry operates. So we fundamentally called up my boss and I the CEO and I called up the president of Shell Oil Company and said, you know what? You got to get out of this group and you got to get out today. We're not supportive of it. And we let him explain why that was not possible. And then we said, well, if you want to come to work tomorrow, you'll get out today. <laughs> and that's what it came down to. We said, it's, it's, you belong to that organization tomorrow, you're out of a job. You may be the president of Shell Oil today, but you won't be tomorrow because we will not have our corporate name associated with such a group. Well, he called and quit the group that night because uh, it was a phony group and we weren't going to be part of it. What are the climate risks to South Carolina, to the East Coast, what are, to American business? It's not an information deficit that we're facing here. It's an affinity deficit. Um, people know about climate change. It's not that we need to educate them that much about climate change to be helpful. But mostly what it is is an affinity deficit. They're not people that look like Republicans that are supporting action on climate. And so if we have more of those, I mean, we've got to have some people uh, what we say at republicen.org is we'll sing this solo if we need to. We'll get a little duet going maybe out on the street. Uh, eventually we get some brass out there on the street and a little band strikes up. At that point, politicians will run around out front to lead the parade where it's already going because politicians <laughs> typically follow, they don't lead. Um, and so it's... Um, it's, it's, it is important to have information. I, I agree with that. Obviously, I'm not discounting the value of science education and all that. That's important. But even more important at this juncture is just having people, having us learn from people that we trust. And all of us learn from people we trust. We don't learn from people we don't trust. 
Jeremy Carl, uh, your uh, neighbor down the hall at the Hoover Institution for three years was uh, James Mattis, now the Secretary of Defense. He famously said uh, he led uh, some Marines in, in 2003 in Iraq, and he said famously, quote, that the military needed to be, quote, unleashed from the tether of fossil fuels, that the supply chain put marine, cost marine lives, it's a security issue, do you agree with him on the military dimensions? Bob English just talked about affinity. Military uh, uh, veterans are very much a Republican um, frame, you know, uh, core of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Speak to the national security aspects. Well, I, I mean, I think that the military has obviously done a lot in this area in the last, uh, under the last administration. Uh, some of it I thought was good. Some of it I thought was kind of uh, maybe not mission critical and, and, and kind of... Uh, putting a green patina where we didn't need to be. But I certainly agree with the general's comment, uh, especially concerning supply lines. And you actually saw a number of good marine deployments, um, the XFOB, I'm forgetting the, this is a experimental forward operating base that the, the Marines operated that was essentially um, solar plus batteries that allowed you to reduce some of those um, supply lines and, and risks. Um, and, and so certainly, to the extent that you can decouple fuel um, at certain types of combat theater, I think it can certainly be very helpful. Uh, I'm not sure how much that ties into the broader questions of climate change and, and climate risk, um, but I do think that certainly uh, there, are, there are elements of national security that come into play. John Hoffmeister, we have Secretary of State uh, Rex Tillerson now. He ran ExxonMobil, you interacted with him. Uh, tell us what kind of Secretary of State you think he'll be. I think he will be deliberate, thoughtful, analytical, and tough, very tough. This is a man who is sure of himself. He doesn't need to tolerate fools. He's dealt firsthand with some of the nastiest people in the world in the industry that he's come from. He could not have been a successful CEO at ExxonMobil without all of the qualities of a statesman and a diplomat. Uh, because when a big company like Exxon goes to Indonesia or Chad or Nigeria, wherever they go, they're not just going to exploit the molecules. Yes, that's the financial purpose, that's the commercial purpose. But they're also going to help build the capability in the country to be able to develop a local workforce, develop the school systems that can produce students who can do the work, because the whole purpose of going into countries like that to get the molecules is if you don't, don't, don't develop the indigenous population, including the institutions of government, the ministries, the legal system for adjudication purposes, your, your mission is to do all of these things simultaneously. I think he's about as well prepared in terms of his background as anyone I can think of, and certainly better than some of our previous secretaries of state, excluding, of course, George Shultz. <laughs> but, uh, but I think the, the reality of, of, of what Rex brings to the job, and it shocked me, not that he would be chosen, but that he would accept the <laughs> challenge, because he brings a hierarchical uh, knowledge of how to use power and authority, He's a brilliant negotiator, and his, if he's done deals with Vladimir Putin, then he's no, he's, he, he can only do those deals if he's making money for Exxon shareholders and showing profit. And to extrude that kind of agreement out of Vladimir Putin, Vladimir didn't get everything Vladimir wanted, that's for sure. And that's been Rex's MO. He, he negotiated the first Sakhalin 1 deal back in, what, 1998 or 99. In, in Russia. So he has a long history of tough, difficult, challenging circumstances, and he's walking into a job that's full of them. We're gonna go now to our lightning round. Uh, yes or no questions for each of our guests. Uh, this is where we get some laughs, make them slightly uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> so John Hoffmeister, first one, uh, yes or no. Oil executives who knowingly deceive the public about the risks of climate change should be held accountable. Yes. Uh, follow up for John Hoffmeister. <clears throat> to reduce that possibility, oil companies don't keep documents that could later prove to be smoking guns, <laughs> like those internal papers that caught up tobacco companies. Release them. Uh, Jeremy Call, uh, yes or no, 
Hillary Clinton's campaign paid more attention to its big donors than average voters. True, in my view. Uh, Bob Inglis, yes or no, Donald Trump will serve out his four-year term. No. <clears throat> uh, John Hoffmeister, the fact that Russian intelligence agencies interfered in the U.S. election on behalf of Donald Trump clouds his legitimacy as President of the United States. Unfortunately, yes. Bob Inglis, yes or no, Donald Trump is a legitimate president. Yes. Jeremy Carl, if the Russians helped Hillary Clinton, you would be shouting from the rooftops to try her for treason and throw her in jail. Um. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't realize that was a statement. Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, Bob Inglis, you are a rhino, Republican in name only. Uh, uh, yes, apparently, based on the current, uh, the, the current climate change view, yeah, I'm definitely Republican in name only. Uh, Jeremy Carl, knowing what you know about rising seas, you would buy oceanfront property in Miami. True. Yes, absolutely. Uh, John Hoffmeister, knowing what you know about rising seas, you would buy oceanfront property in the Gulf of Mexico. No. Um, last one for Bob Inglis. Are more Republicans in Congress in the gay closet or the climate closet? <laughs> uh, I, th I, think, I think more in the climate closet as far as I don't know. I, I, I know about, yeah, more in the climate. Let's uh, give them a round. Thank them for getting through that climate uh, spotlight. <laughs> we have to wrap it up there. I'd like to thank Jeremy Carr from the Hoover Institution, John Hoffmeister, former president of Shell Oil, Bob Inglis, former member of Congress from South Carolina. I'm Greg Dalton. I'm the host of Climate One. I'd like to thank our audience in here in the room in San Francisco and online. You can join the conversation on Twitter using our handle at Climate One and listen podcasts in the iTunes store. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>